Welcome to A Late Show. I am your host, Stephen Colbert. Americans are still emotionally processing yesterday's verdict by a Minnesota jury that found Derek Chauvin guilty on three counts in the murder of George Floyd. It brings up a lot of complex feelings because no jury verdict can bring George Floyd back, but the news of this accountability was celebrated across the nation. In Minnesota, New York, and across the street from the White House in Black Lives Matter Plaza, where people were dancing and crying with relief. What a difference 11 months make. Last time they were crying from tear gas and rubber bullets. Now the problem of police violence against people of color is still far from solved. While this is a welcome verdict, it's like wiping up a spill on the Titanic. Good job. Now let's focus on the water pooling around our ankles. President Biden addressed it last night. Let's also be clear that such a verdict is also much too rare. For so many people, it seems like it took a unique and extraordinary convergence of factors. Yeah, it should not take nine minutes of damning video to get some accountability. There's a reason the Pledge of Allegiance doesn't say, with liberty and justice for all who are being filmed on an iPhone. Otherwise, sucks to be you. In fact, holding police accountable is so rare that Chauvin's conviction was the first time in Minnesota history that a white police officer was convicted of killing a black civilian on the job. For more context on how rare this decision is, we turn now to Late Show resident American historian, Professor John Thibodeau. Thanks so much for being here, John. Salutations, Steve. John, I know you're one of my writers. When did you become a historian? When I bought this vest. Okay. Well, looking at this trial, having seen that terrible tape, I never doubted for a moment that Chauvin would be found guilty. Did you? Yes, more than a moment. Why? History, Steve. What, what part of history? All of it. Well, you're the one with the pipe. But I was pretty confident. Was, was I being naive? No, you were being white. Okay, that checks out. That's also why you wear fleece vests and own a boat. I was wondering. <laughs> hey, I gotta ask, did, did your pipe get bigger? Yes, it did. This is the pipe I use on 420. Uh, it's 421, John. Well, it's a big pipe, and I've almost cashed it. <laughs> Historian John Thibodeau, everybody. Gotta get some snacks. Speaking of people facing consequences for criminal actions, the FBI continues to track down Capitol rioters, and I'll give you the latest in tonight's seditionist roundup roundup. You can run, but you can't raw hide. Tonight, we focus on Kentucky resident and ski lodge slender man, Stephen Chase Randolph. Randolph was captured on video during the riot as he knocked over a U.S. Capitol Police officer, causing her head to hit the stairs behind her, resulting in a loss of consciousness. Yes, but Matt Gates has just floated the theory that the stairs were Antifa. People on the internet saw images of Randolph at the insurrection and dubbed him Gray Carhartt Hat, Based on his knit cap, yes, internet sleuths are nicknaming insurrectionists after what they wore, which is embarrassing, for hashtag obvious spanks guy. <laughs> the FBI identified Randolph from his girlfriend's Instagram posts using facial recognition software. It's pretty easy for the software to find him, considering his girlfriend's Instagram contained a photo of Randolph wearing the same gray hat with the white Carhartt embroidered on the front. So he wore his trademark hat to the riot. It's the easiest crime the FBI has had to solve since they caught this endangered animal smuggler. The feds went all out to make sure they had the right guy here. Two FBI agents went undercover at Randolph's work, and he told them that it was fun to be part of the mob and opined that the Capitol Police officer he pushed down off to the ground likely had a concussion. Well, it's clear that someone in this story has brain damage. Oh, speaking of little pricks, Americans continue to get vaccinated at unprecedented rates. And I'll fill you in on the latest in tonight's installment of The Vaccine.
My sentiments exactly. <laughs> so far, half of American adults have received at least one shot, and among all the countries in the world, the United States is first in total vaccinations. Woo! We're number one, baby! We're number one! Side effects of the vaccine may include spontaneous number shouting and giant foam finger. But we've got a long way to go before we don't have to stand a long way away from each other. Currently, just over a quarter of the population is fully vaccinated. But to suppress the spread of the virus, experts say that somewhere between 70 to 85 percent of the country needs to be immune to the virus. 70 percent of Americans don't agree on anything. To get that many people to want the shot, they're going to have to introduce the new deep fried flavor blasted Pfizer now in Blazing Buffalo Mouth Massacre. It's not. <laughs> sounds spicy. It's not going to be easy. In the latest Axios, Ipsos, Hungry Hungry Hippos poll, <laughs> the majority of respondents say they were already vaccinated, but of those who weren't, more than half of them said they probably weren't going to get it. And by it, I assume a grasp on reality. Though without the vaccine, another thing they may not get, old. <laughs> this afternoon, speaking of old, President Biden tried to make it easier for people who cannot miss work to get the vaccine. I'm calling on every employer, large and small, in every state, to give employees the time off they need with pay to get vaccinated. And any time they need with pay to recover if they're feeling under the weather after the shot. That is the right thing to do. Hey, you know what? Come to think of it, I got my second dose last week and <clears throat> I'm feeling a little under the weather. Viacom, CBS, Paramount Plus, maybe I should head home and get some shut eye. What's that? No. I'm lying <laughs> and I have to continue to do the show? Yeah. Okay, fine. Of course, it wouldn't be a Joe Biden speech if he didn't toss in a little old gaff. Patty Young owns a hair salon in Springfield, Ohio. She's also dedicated to getting her customers and employers vaccin employees vaccinated that when they leave the saloon, the receptionist the saloon, the salon. Well, they may be going to a saloon. I don't know. But when... They may be going to a saloon. I always stop there after visiting the blacksmith. Then I pop by the cobbler and take the trolley home all for a nickel. All aboard! <laughs> <laughs> Never fails to remind us that he is crowned with many winters. <laughs> but... Biden may not be the guy to convince a large number of those people because 44% of Republicans say they do not intend to get vaccinated. Okay, how about this, Republicans? A vaccine arms your immune system with little medical guns. Pew, pew, pew. The vaccine builds a wall against virus caravans, which are trying to cancel your culture of continuing to be alive. John Voigt, Chick-fil-A. There might be... One way to convince these anti-vaxxers, a recent poll found that one in five vaccine-hesitant Republicans said an endorsement by the former president would spur them to get immunized. That's a long shot. Old drinks with two hands isn't going to waste his endorsement power on a life-saving vaccine. He saves that for important stuff like casinos, steaks, bottled water, neckties, wine, golf courses, and accused child sex traffickers. Of course, the commander in cheese did get vaccinated back in January secretly, even though there was a big push inside the White House to get him to do it on camera. But his aides shot that down, saying, have you ever seen him wear a short sleeve shirt in public? I don't think that's going to happen. So nearly half of America could be embracing the vaccines if he wasn't too vain to show a little saggy shoulder boob. <laughs> also, I want to point out that it's not the short sleeves that are the biggest problem here. <laughs> Oh, there's big science news out of Texas, where a Republican state legislator wants to legalize deer cloning. I have very strong opinions about deer cloning, and I am about to find out what they are in my new long-running segment, Let's Get Bucked Up! Public domain music! This fight 
going down in the Lone Star State involves a lawmaker who is accusing state wildlife officials of undermining breeders' attempts to spawn big bucks with a regulation forbidding deer cloning. Why would anyone in Texas want to clone deer? Why would anyone in Texas want to clone deer? Well, in Texas, there's big business in shoot. I didn't read it the right way the first time, you see. I had to go back and get the right inflection because inflection means a lot. You see, down in Texas, there's big business in shooting animals at uh, private ranches, and the ranchers want to boost their business with the most impressive bucks with towering racks that fetch the highest prices. Impressive racks, huh? Is this a ranch or a deer brothel? Come on down to the Boom Boom Bambi's home of the bucks and bucks. Bring your rifle or your penis, which you pretend is your rifle. And the cat is already out of the bag, and by cat I mean deer, and by bag I mean synthetic deer uterus. Because one Texas rancher says he's cloned somewhere between 35 and 40 deer over the past decade. So there are a bunch of deer clones out there already. You know what this means? Texas is about to open Jurassic Park. Don't move or they'll nibble your hydrangeas. We got a great show for you tonight. My guests are Ed Helms and the author of Madam Speaker, Susan Page. But when we come back, Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop has some great ideas for how to ruin your Mother's Day. Stick around. <laughs>